Well, good evening. Uh, it's wonderful to see this big house on a Friday evening at Roosevelt House. I'm Harold Holzer, and uh, on behalf of Hunter College President Jennifer Rabb, who I was hoping to say more about, uh, when, but she's a little bit late. She has a lot of events tonight. Um, I'm just delighted that you're all here. Welcome to Roosevelt House, um, the home of the extraordinary uh, public policy program that exists and thrives here. This is the home that uh, Sarah Delano Roosevelt built and Jennifer Rabb rebuilt. Um, <laughs> well, we love welcoming elected leaders here. Um, Carolyn Maloney will be here in a few minutes. I, I'm not going to interrupt the proceedings, but I did want to say how um, and you can all bear witness to my saying so, how grateful we are at Hunter to have had her as Hunter College's representative in Congress, indeed the community's representative in Congress for 30 years. Um, I've known her for only 40 because I knew her in the days in the council. So uh, we will see her later and we will toast and thank her. Um, as you know, this is the, um, very briefly, the home where Franklin Roosevelt um, transitioned from presidential candidate to president-elect. It's where um, he held his planning sessions with his brain trust for the four months between his election and inauguration. And we always, and we will be reminding ourselves for the next year because next, this, this period, is the 90th anniversary of that transition. It goes into next year. The 90th anniversary of the creation of the foundational building blocks of the New Deal. And we always remember that it was on February 5th, 1933. My birthday, but it's really the 90th, <laughs> not 1933, February 5th. 90 years ago on this coming February 5th, um, Francis Perkins, the state labor commissioner, walked into that room upstairs Senator John, where we were just hanging out, and said, yes, I'll become the first woman in the cabinet if you promise Governor Roosevelt to do minimum wage, maximum hours, and old age pensions. So this is the house where Social Security was born. <laughs> well, the, the big news tonight is, aside from the, our guests, is that this is a milestone day for Roosevelt House because it is uh, the inauguration of a lecture series that I will um, talk about in just a second because President Rabb is making her way to her seat. And <laughs> I just, I, I, didn't, I didn't know that the President was coming until a few hours ago, so I didn't prepare anything. But um, Jennifer, I said this is the house that Sarah built and Jennifer Rabb rebuilt. But I just want to say, Um, just speaking from the heart for a second, um, I would not be here if it wasn't for Jennifer Rabb. Much more importantly, I'm not sure this house would be here if it wasn't for Jennifer Rabb. Um, it would have been, as I said for the record a few days ago, a ruin or an oligarch's mansion. <laughs> it would have been sold off and not be a great asset for Hunter College and for the students and for the faculty and the community. As, you, as most of you may know, uh, President Rabb announced this week that she would be stepping down from the presidency in June. I can't imagine this place or Hunter without her. And I just want to take my first opportunity to say thank you, thank you, Jennifer Rabb. So this is a brand new lecture series that will feature distinguished advocates for democracy. Um, our sponsor was very specific about that idea, uh, and that's a category into which our special guest, Senator Whitehouse, fits perfectly, not to mention John Avalon. Um, and um, it's, uh, I just want to say, uh, Tony, our, our sponsor, has said not to speak about him, just a little bit. He is a, a mentor, a friend, a donor, um, an advisor. Uh, he's, um, he was here when I got here. He was a frequent flyer at these events, and he is now a member of our advisory board and one of our most generous 
supporters, and he's he's a lot of fun too. I and mean, I just have a great time with him. Tony Stepanski, thank you for sponsoring this series. Uh, now to our special participants. This is the second time that uh, Senator Sheldon Whitehouse of Rhode Island has appeared at Roosevelt House, although I think the first time it was on Zoom, and now he's here. Um, he's here to talk about his latest book, and we are delighted to have him. He was, a, he was before um, running for the Senate, he was a U.S. attorney and a state attorney general. He's been a fearless and outspoken Capitol Hill spokesman on the corporate infiltration of American democracy and the flow of dark money into the legislative uh, and the executive and the judicial branches of government. He's here to talk about one of those branches today. Um, and at a time when um, a former president is talking about discarding the Constitution, it's good to know that there's one White House where democracy rules. I know, I shouldn't have said it, right? I ha I'm sure you get a lot of puns on the name, but I had to do one. Um, I, may, I, I know other people have made jokes, but I may be the only um, person who cares that Rhode Island had a senator and a governor who were named Lincoln. Now, how many people know that, right? Or Link, as they call them. <laughs> um, born in New York, educated at Yale, Senator Whitehouse is the son and grandson of diplomats and a descendant of Charles Crocker, the railroad magnate who helped finish the Transcontinental Railroad for Lincoln. Not that I'm obsessing about Lincoln. Um, <laughs> Senator, welcome to FDR's home. His, <laughs> his interlocutor is um, my friend John Avlon, a crusading television journalist whose CNN reality checks were sometimes um, the only segments that snap us into reality. And he is a... Uh, uh, brilliant writer and historian as well, um, author of Washington's Farewell, and recently, here I go again, Lincoln and the Fight for Peace, but that's not on me, that's on John. A wonderful book, uh, a brilliant analysis of why hard wars sometimes need to be followed by soft pieces. Um, and as he points out in this house, think of the peace after World War I versus the peace after World War II. Um, I have to tell you that broadcast history that right upstairs as well, FDR gave his first fireside chat four score years and one month ago when the man he defeated for president was a little slow to concede. Um, so it is, um, I know, and the person who failed to concede, to, to concede was uh, John's wife's great grandfather, Herbert Hoover. So, you know, it's a, a very fraught and complicated story in American <laughs> politics. So many historical touchstones. So tonight our guests will speak for about 40 minutes uh, and uh, have a conversation. And then uh, John Avlon will ask you if you have anything to add to the discussion. We'd love to have your questions. And then a reception upstairs hosted by Tony Stepanski and um, with book signings. Uh, Senator Whitehouse will be signing his book. So will you please join me now in welcoming Senator Sheldon Whitehouse in conversation with John Avlon. Thank you, Harold. Uh, Senator, good to see you. Good to see you, John. Wonderful uh, to be here with you. I'll tell you, so, you know, if, if you read politicians' books, the vast majority are, are in the bin of sort of extended self-congratulation. Uh, this isn't that. This is a really well-researched argument about a really urgent issue that doesn't get enough comprehensive coverage, um, which is the way our judiciary has become politicized, um, and unduly influenced slash hijacked by ideological and corporate interests. So if that sounds like a good time, we're gonna have a really good time over the next hour. <laughs> um, I, I wanna begin with a great quote uh, that you use in the book um, from Alexander Hamilton. We'll go OG New York, founding father, Alexander Hamilton. Uh, the Constitution is gone, it is a dead letter. It is a vapor which the breath of faction in a moment may dissipate. Have we hit that point that Hamilton feared? Pretty darn close, I would say. Um, first, before I pursue that, let me say thank you to Roosevelt House for having me. Thank you to Tony Stepanski for 
the lecture series and allowing me to be the first uh, speaker at it. Um, and it's a pleasure, John, to be with you. So I'm, I'm a little bit, if I'm a little bit overwhelmed, and forgive me. Um, but yeah, the one thing about the Hamilton quote is that it doesn't impute any causation to the problem of the judges no longer being willing to impartially enforce the law. And what my book is about, and thank you for calling it an argument, because I think that's a very good description of it in one word, is to explain how it is that the court became the way it is. Um, and I describe it as a captured court, not a conservative court. They violate conservative judicial doctrine all the time. But a captured court in the same way, back to uh, Charlie Crocker, uh, that... Um, the old railroad barons used to capture and run the railroad commissions by stocking them with their flunkies so they would do what they wanted. And I think that is the conceptual model that you have to have for this court. Once you have that model, then the likelihood that they enforce the Constitution the way they should and not the way that, for instance, their anti-abortion supporters want them to um, brings to life Hamilton's quote. So let's drill down on one point you just made because I don't want to gloss over it. You, one of the things you point out is that um, they contradict alleged conservative principles all the time. Constantly. Ex explain. Constantly. Well, let's just start with originalism. And by the way, if anybody is interested in this subject, then Dean Chemerinsky from UC Berkeley Law School just wrote a book called Worse Than Nothing, which is a really intelligent takedown of originalism. So I'm going to pump his book briefly. Um, but originalism, if, let's just pick that and let's look at Citizens United, which is one of the most offensive partisan decisions that the court has rendered. Um, if you go back and look at the Constitution, there is no place in which there's any role for non-human persons. If you read through the Philadelphia debates, or at least the notes from them, there is no mention whatsoever of any political role for corporations. Um, if you read through the Federalist Papers, the only mentions of corporations are of municipal corporations. So there's literally no originalist support for the notion that corporate entities should have any role in American politics, let alone unlimited political spending, which was the prize that Citizens United gave overtly and let alone dark money, anonymous unlimited political spending, which is the prize that the five Bedsock justices delivered covertly. Let, let's talk about Citizens United, but first I feel like out of deference to your book, you know, you've got a lot of ink spent on Justice Powell and, and his memo as yep. sort of being the uh, original sin, thin edge of the wedge for how we got here. So uh, explain to folks why you are not a Justice Powell fan. So actually there's a lot to admire about uh, Justice Powell, and he was on the right side of a great number of cases, and he was clearly a very intelligent yeah. and capable lawyer. Um, but before he came onto the court, at the behest of the United States Chamber of Commerce, he wrote them a memo to deal with what he saw and what they saw as a crisis of lost corporate political power. And how, the memo was to uh, answer, were we to get corporate political power back, given that it was the 60s, it was the 70s, everything was in upheaval, you know, all of our traditional touchstones were being questioned. And um, he touched on a couple of areas, but the important one here was a chapter that he did in his memo on the overlooked opportunity in the courts, in which he said that a activist court could actually do enormous things to change the economy and society of our country. And if you, again, you go back to the railroad, the corrupted railroad commissions of the late 19th century, um, regulatory capture and agency capture has been a around for a long, long time. But if you look for the moment when somebody decided to cross the Rubicon and take that tactic of agency and regulatory capture and apply it now not to a regulatory agency, but to a court, a court of justice. 
I think that Powell memo plants the seed of that idea. And uh, it was shortly afterwards that that Rubicon began to be crossed and systemically um, powerful right-wing folks began to build and fund an infrastructure that was designed to capture the court. So what some of the context around this, I mean, Powell is regarded as a centrist judge who evolved, but he had this uh, memo. But part of the animus- And then in, on the court, he started giving corporations political rights. Right. He started in Bilotti versus Bank of Massachusetts, saying, okay, corporations can play in state-level referendums, and then on it grew. The foundation for what became Citizens United came through a series of Powell decisions in which he either wrote the decision or was part of the, of the necessary, he was the leading voice or part of the majority in the, right. in the case. So just to go back a step to my original point about how there's really no role for corporations in American democracy according to an originalist view, according to the founders, if you actually look back at the trajectory that built corporate power, it is Republican appointees to the United States Supreme Court who did it. It's been done by the Supreme Court, by the Republican appointees, and very largely in our lifetimes. It could, could be argued perhaps, I mean, someone argue it, it's a made up right. It is a made up a, right. A number, if you will. So, uh, uh, but let's talk about the re other Republican justices who were appointed by Nixon and elsewhere because they were really demonized by these sort of new conservatives. It's not just Powell. It's Stevens, it's Souter. I mean, we forget that, you know, majority on- O'Connor. O'Connor. Um, it's a majority on, on Roe v. Wade. I mean, Wade, I mean, there were, I think, four or five Republicans who, in, in addition to Harry Blackman, who wrote that opinion. Um, so in the, when the Federal Society is created, and this is a key, perhaps the point of your book, they have special hatred for these Republican appointee turncoats. I'd say it a little bit differently. However you would say it. I think that um, there was hatred of what they called the turncoats. Um, the failure of Bork to be confirmed created lots of anger and resentment. Souter and Stevens and O'Connor making decisions that they did caused a lot of resentment. I don't know that you can blame that on the Federalist Society. I think the Federalist Society had a separate trajectory that brought it to power. I think that once it had that power, it was then seen as a useful venue for those right-wing forces to begin to move in and start to control the um, judicial nominees. And when Trump said, I'm gonna go off this Federal Society list, mm -hmm. then he really made it official. And at that point, you had a private group in whose back room somewhere, anonymous individuals were picking Supreme Court justices while at the same time that organization was receiving large anonymous multi-million dollar contributions. That is a prescription for corruption. But I think that the Federalist Society being the venue for that is a slightly different thing than the Federalist Society being the cause of that. Interesting distinction. Um, let's talk about Citizens United because it's sort of the, the oh, but, I'm, but to, to your point, Alito is on the court because of that anger. Yes. And, and Harriet Myers was the person that those right-wing nuts, to use the phrase from your terrific book, <laughs> wing nuts, <laughs> that they were, were afraid would be another O'Connor, would be another Souter, would be another Stevens. This was an, a nominee, an actual nominee of a Republican president to the Supreme Court who they hit back at so hard that humiliatingly W. Bush had to withdraw his own nominee in the face of fire from the right. And the vacancy that that created is Mr. Dobbs himself, Sam Alito. <laughs> Mr. Dobbs. So, but, but I, I think there, there's a broader point here too, let me just put a, you know, sort of hang a lantern on it. I mean, Earl Warren was the Republican governor of California, um, lest we forget who oversaw Brown v. Board. Um, there was a tradition of judges of different parties putting forward folks who had a tendency to sort of coalesce toward the center. Big decisions, as you point out in the book, were traditionally not done 5-4, right, because it would be seen as divisive. But instead, what we've seen is an explicitly ideological and political approach to court appointees that's actually a departure from most of American history, and that itself has politicized the court. Yes. 
Correct. Okay. Let's talk about Citizens United. Anthony Kennedy, did, again, like Paul, did a lot of great things. He wrote Oberfell. But if he were asked about Citizens United, he would say it was a free speech decision. It wasn't about money and politics. <laughs> Why is he wrong? Because the equation of money in politics with free speech is not accurate. Um, yes, money is a means of applying influence, like speech is, and therefore it has similarities, but gunfire is also a means of applying influence. In fact, our country was formed and was resurrected by Abraham Lincoln through gunfire. But that doesn't mean that you have a First Amendment right to run around shooting people as long as it's consistent with your views. Or a Second Amendment right, as it were. Yeah, but the Second Amendment right is to own. The First Amendment right, right would be this is expression. When you're shooting people, you're engaged in expression. And what the court said is when you're throwing huge amounts of money at politicians, you're engaged in expression. Yeah, the problem is it's not just expression. It's also muscle, bribery, corruption, all of these things. And to put the worst gloss on it, there's a lie built into the decision, which is that all this money is going to be transparent, when I think they probably all knew that it would not be. And facts have proven that it for sure is not. We're over a billion dollars in non-transparent money just in this last election. So a billion dollars proving that decision false, and yet the court won't go back to try to clean up the mess. The reason they had to say that it was going to be transparent is because they couldn't get around the proposition that dark money is corrupting. The only person who disagreed that dark money was corrupting was Clarence Thomas. All the other eight built, baked in the idea that dark money causes corruption. Period, end of story, that is eight to one law in this country. And yet, when dark money presents itself, none of them are willing to address it as corruption any longer. And it's a real frustration about that decision. Well, it's, it's also made more ludicrous by the fact that the FEC, the Federal Elections Commission, is intentionally deadlocked so it does not enforce the law. Correct. Right, which is, is a huge problem. A whole separate story. Yeah, but, but, but a complementary one, so to speak. Yes. But let, let's talk about how, how, in the wake of Citizens United, United, you do a great job of describing how things almost turn on a dime in terms of the money that flows into politics at an unprecedented rate. And one of the things about your book is, you know, you, you track just the money coming in, the impact on politics, particularly climate change. And, and you point out that, uh, you know, the immediate increase in congressional spending in 2010, by 2020, you say the cycle was $14.4 billion, more than twice what was spent just four years earlier. Much of it negative, sure. Uh, updated for this uh, a book is that we now have the at least preliminary results of the 2022 midterm elections, $16.7 billion. So almost $3 billion more spent on a midterm election. And to add a further refinement to that point, if you go through the recent contested Senate races, mm -hmm. you will find several of them in which the Republican candidate and the Democratic candidate raised approximately the same proportion of money compared to the outside money that came into their races. But in a great many of the races, you will see that the Democrat massively outweighed, outraised the Republican. And the Republican was standing on almost exclusively this outside money and dark money. In some cases, 80 and 90 percent of their money came from these big outside group special interest spenders. If that isn't a sign of Corruption in the offing, I don't know what could be. Now, your, your Senate colleague, Lindsey Graham, said that the real problem in the Georgia election was that he was so massively outspent by Democrats, Republicans were, so. Yeah, um, ha ha. <laughs> Let's talk about the- No, what, the, what, he, what he means when he says that is that Reverend Warnock massively outraised Walker, and therefore the big Republican donors had to come in and write huge amounts of checks to try to prop up the most defective candidate in recent Senate campaign history. That sounds like a, a fair distinction. Um, let's talk about the immediate impact in 2010, and, and let's use climate as a prism. 
because it's something you, you write a lot about and you've done a lot of work on. So um, before 2010, you point out, there was actually broad bipartisan consensus on climate with your colleague and if friend. not consensus, a lot of activity. A lot of activity, lot and so, of sorry, broad overlap. Right? We all remember sort of the, the, the remember the, uh, the, the almost surreal uh, Nancy Pelosi, Newt Gingrich ad where they're talking about how they both agree climate change is a problem. Sitting on the couch. Yeah, sitting of the on the couch. And, and of course, your, your friend and colleague, John McCain, was very active in this. And then 2010. Runs for president on a strong climate platform. There you go. 2010, things change on a dime. Describe how that changed. And then also, you have a really telling anecdote about Harry Reid telling you uh, that the bill that's passed in the House is not going to be taken up by the Senate because the Obama White House doesn't want to push it. Yep. I was struck by that. Tell me about that. Well, the, the I was sworn in in... 2007, January of 2007, so for those first three years, 2007, 2008, and 2009, we were constantly working on climate legislation in a bipartisan way in the Senate. You had the John Warner, Joe Lieberman bill. You had the Lindsey Graham, John Kerry bill. You had the Maria Cantwell, um, Susan Collins bill, and you had John McCain's campaign platform as the presidential candidate. And so it was pretty vibrant. And I was there at the time, and we had hearings, and people argued back and forth. It was what you wanted a legislature to be doing. In January of 2010, like a heart attack, it stopped dead. The heartbeat stopped. It flatlined. And from January of 2010 to now, no Republican member of the United States Senate has been willing to get on any serious piece of climate legislation. And January of 2010 is the date of the Citizens United decision. So if, as I believe, the fossil fuel industry saw that decision coming and was ready with a scheme to rapidly deploy enormous amounts of money and was also rapidly willing to deploy emissaries to Mitch McConnell and over to the House to say, fellas, the fun's over with screwing around on climate. You join our team, and we can get you unlimited money. You have anybody who crosses us, we'll take them out. And there was a House member named Bob Inglis who was figuratively hung from a lamppost by the right because he would not walk away from climate. So between the positive pressure of the leader saying, hey, guys, we got all the money we need. You just have to shut up about climate and Inglis hanging on the lamppost over there, the message was pretty bright and clear that the days of bipartisanship on climate are over. But you say also that at that brief point where there was a 60-vote majority for Democrats in the Senate, that the Obama White House said, don't pursue climate change yeah. legislation now. That, yeah. that surprised the heck out of me. Yeah, well, it, it disappointed the heck out of me. We had wonderful Nancy Pelosi, who had pushed through cap and trade. We had a bill ready to go in the House. People had taken really hard votes. Tom Periolo lost his race over it, probably. Mm -hmm. And then the bill comes over to the Senate, and Harry Reid says to me, Sheldon, we're not, we're not going to take it up. And we're not going to do a parallel bill to get into conference to try to see if any... We're gonna, that bill is going to die here in the Senate with no action. And I said, Harry, you can't do that. Why is that? He said, well, the message from the White House is, we're tired of fighting. We don't want any more conflict. We're all burned out by the amount of quarreling that we've had over health care, and we just simply are uh, done with fighting, which is kind of interesting because this guy, FDR, he was never done with fighting. And if you don't have that instinct to take fighting and turn it to your advantage in politics, you're missing a pretty essential component of the suite of talents that you need. But the Obama administration, for some reason, wanted to walk away, and they did. It took four years before they uh, revived any interest in climate change. So I want to get to, we're going to get to. painful years. It, it, you know, and that's extraordinary detail I hadn't read before, and I actually want to, next time I'm with some folks from the Obama administration, I'm going to press them on that point. Yeah, I'd but, like that too. Um, so we've got around 10 minutes. Uh, I want to hit a couple points before we get to, to your questions. Um, uh, let's talk about, one of the things about climate you say is that you think climate denial could be actionable fraud under RICO statute. You're a former U.S. attorney. That fast me. Quickly explain how that could work. So not too long ago, um, under the Clinton administration, actually, the Department of Justice filed a lawsuit against the tobacco industry. 
for fraudulent misrepresentation of the dangers of tobacco. And they brought the case before a uh, judge in the U.S. District Court in the District of Columbia. And um, what was her name? Gladys Keller, I want to say? Kessler. Kessler, thank you. Mr. Wachtel knows. She wrote a thousand-page decision that just buried the industry factually. And then the industry, of course, appealed it up to the DC Circuit, and they just buried the industry. So there actually is a civil judgment in which the Department of Justice won a judgment against the tobacco industry that thou shalt lie no more. Hmm. And when they were under court order to lie no more, their whole political and public relations operations collapsed and actually migrated over to the climate denial business including in some cases the same people and the same groups. So that was quite a uh, The, the quite strategy a is actually called Merchants of Doubt, which is actually the title of a documentary and was the early tobacco memos. It's, it's quite parallel. Let's talk about um, some, some potential solutions to this problem, because I think people are exhausted about talking about problems. Let's, let's talk about solutions. You've been a backer of the Disclose Act, yep. se semi-related. Tell folks what yep. that is. So the Disclose Act means if you want to spend more than 10 grand in a political election, you've got to out yourself for who you are. So that citizens who have a relatively important role in our democracy are not denied the important knowledge of who's playing for whose team. It's really hard to be a good citizen and participate effectively in democracy if everybody who is fighting each other in front of you is hiding behind masks. So if Exxon comes into Rhode Island and runs ads saying Sheldon Whitehouse is a bum and he's a louse and he's no good and he hates puppies and he hates prosperity, <laughs> this ad brought to you by Exxon Mobil, everybody in Rhode Island gets the joke immediately. It's useless. But if you run it through a group called Rhode Islanders for Peace and Puppies and Prosperity, and nobody knows who the hell you are, you've got a whole different set of tools at your disposal, and it becomes really, really dangerous. And once you have that power, you actually don't even have to show up and spend the money. You can threaten to spend the money because the candidates and the parties and the leaders will know you have that power. So now it's not only anonymous, but it's a secret conversation, a secret threat. Hello, Carolyn, I'm so glad you're Carolyn here. Maloney, Aren't you wonderful just joining to be us? here? Congresswoman You're Carolyn Maloney. So if you can make the spending clear, then all of that poison goes out of politics. And frankly, like turning on the light bulb in the kitchen, mm -hmm. the cockroaches will scuttle once they know who they are. And by the way, the ads will be less filthy because the only reason people lie and smear as much as they do in politics right now is because you can throw away the entity that is the mouthpiece like Kleenex, like toilet paper, and the true speaker is insulated from the awful things that they have, have said. And one thing we added to the bill along the way as this nonsense with the courts became more apparent is that if you're spending money on com campaign ads for Supreme Court justices, mm -hmm. you've got to disclose yourself too. Because people were writing individual checks for $15 million for $17 million to fund the TV ad campaigns run by a fictitious name outfit called Judicial Crisis Network against Garland, and then for Gorsuch, and then for Kavanaugh, and then for Barrett. So um, we would even out the spending for Supreme Court nominees. So um, in principle, you would agree, given the problem with dark money in politics, that liberal dark money is as much a problem as Republic, conservative dark money. Not quite. Correct or no? Not quite. As a matter of principle. Not quite. Because, at least in my experience, liberal, liberal dark money is usually based on um, emotion, policy, sort of iliomocenary desire to impose views into the public sphere. But I don't know anybody on the Democratic dark money side who is making money off their dark money expenditures. Well, the guys who do the ad buys are. OK. <laughs> yes. The operatives along the way can make themselves Needs quite rich. Yeah. But if you're the fossil fuel industry, for instance, and you are defending your right to pollute 
which the International Monetary Fund has valued at $660 billion per year in America. That's the value they get from polluting for free, which is not e e proper economics. In proper economics, the cost of the harm of your product goes into the price of your product. They don't want that. They want to socialize the harm and capitalize the cost, the profits. So um, $660 billion. So if you can spend, let's say, $6.6 .6 billion every single year in politics to keep the Republican Party in line to block any legislation that would hold you accountable for your pollution, you are earning 100 times that investment every single year. And we don't have, I don't think on our side, anything like that motivation. So it means that the money on the Republican side is going to be much more persistent, much more reliable, and much more... Um, Motivated. So you, you think there's a difference qualitatively because of the profit motive? The money's What's the same. Right. And yep. in one election, it can wash itself out, one, you know, one against the other. But over time, the Republican money is going to stay, and the Republican leaders know it, and they're hooked up for that reason. Well, one, one thing that you, know, you, you can argue, I mean, the Federalist Society has been very effective. Um, you don't like the ends, but they've been enormously effective in a relatively short period of time. Is there a move, should there be a move, or should there not be a move, for societal <laughs> reasons, towards a, a liberal equivalent, a liberal version of the Federalist Society? In theory, we have the American Constitution Society, but the problem is that the Federalist Society isn't the problem in and of itself. The Federalist Society is the venue. The Federalist Society is the place. What was the place up in upstate New York where the gangsters went to meet? The, the lodge where they got busted out in the 50s and everybody was running around, you remember that? So the federal society is like that location where the big dark money people went to scheme in the back room and decide who was going to be on the Federalist Society list. Um, but I think to blame the Federalist Society for this is to fail to look behind the curtain to see who's really pulling the strings. I, b before we get to your questions, and I have one topical question related to this, but are there any other solutions, given that you have a Citizens United problem, given that constitutional amendments are difficult to achieve in this environment. Um, what are well, some of the other solutions you look to to not have us sort of degenerate into a partisan court which delegitimizes one of the branches of government and, and therefore institutionalizes you know, the, the, the power of money over individuals? Well, tr transparency works generally. We can do disclose constitutionally and solve the Citizens United problem that way if only the Republicans would not block it. Um, but over in the court, there are other areas in which there is a real serious lack of transparency. One is that they have no ethics code that anybody has any power to enforce or even has any regular process for dealing with. Two, they allow f little flotillas of amici curiae, friends of the court, to appear without disclosing properly who is behind them. If you show up as an amicus curiae and the only thing you disclose is who funded the printing and binding and distribution of your brief, you just say, I didn't get any money. And in a recent brief that I wrote, I actually did an appendix at the back that went through a dozen amici and did a, a grid with the big funders and a check mark for which ones were commonly funded. This business of flotillas of front groups coming into the court without disclosing who their common backers are is a huge problem for the court, particularly when you put that against the outcomes. And you see that it is almost inevitable that the right-wing groups, when they appear, get what they came for, or a piece of what they came for. You, you, you mentioned um, the, the, the no, ethical, no, no ethics, official ethics standards for the Supreme Court. Now, one of the things you guys are dealing with in the Senate right now is a lame duck session, and there's a lot on the ballot. You guys got to get ECA done, Electoral Counter Act. Please get that done. Um, there's, there's a defense authorization bill. There's de you know, debt limit and all that. But uh, the, a New Yorker uh, writer, Jane Meyer, Mayer, pointed out that lawmakers added a provision to the National Defense Authorization Act. I'm reading her tweet here. Yep. Protecting Supreme Court spouses from having to reveal any outside employer in the name of security. Now, obviously, we all agree that Supreme Court families, uh, the threats that have been lodged to people for whatever reason are utterly unacceptable. That's not acceptable. But, what Jane Mayer points out, if this passes, Jenny Thomas's professional entanglements would effectively be state secrets. What is the status of that provision? 
It is in the NDAA. The NDAA is almost certain to pass. Uh, Speaker Pelosi has been heroic with her leadership team, thank you, Chairman Maloney, at salvaging the NDAA as it was crashing. And um, I think we're gonna get the bill as a result of a real um, you know, Hail Mary catch by the Speaker. She, ha she is a master of Congress. And um, yes. <laughs> Uh, but but that that piece is baked in. I love Jane. She's one of my heroes. I think this may be a little bit strong. Um, what this bill emerged from, it came through the Senate Judiciary Committee, was the New Jersey judge whose family was shot in her home and the concern from judges everywhere that they were under a lot of danger. And now that family were being shot, could we protect that information from disclosure. I actually baked in a number of transparency provisions that are uh, in the bill, as I understand it, in the NDAA, but the whole Jimmy Thomas saga emerged since then and has put a whole new gloss so on it, this. It, it, obviously, you know, first of all, children are an utterly separate category, but do you think, therefore, in this case, it that was her the, concerns it was are the misplaced? the judge's spouse who was shot. Yeah, sorry. Um, do, do you think her concerns are misplaced? You know, I case. think that um, I, I don't feel as strongly about the uh, issue as, as she does. I think there's, we will look at it again in the wake of what we now know about Justice Thomas's wife. Um, but I think it's going to take some close looking to show that there actually is something that we would not know about her activities because of this bill had it passed. I'm not. I'm not quite there yet, but I love Jane. She's a hero. She's an American hero. Her work on dark money is fabulous, and she's like she literally wrote the book on it. There you go. Okay, we have good question time for this extraordinary audience. Um, we've got around 10, 15 minutes. You, sir, in the back. Uh, Senator, your discussion. Mike, microphone. To you behind you. You're discussing in this book the integrity, and that includes, I presume, the independence of the federal judiciary. And yet what I hear from you is a purely partisan political argument. How do you square this? Well, um, I admit to being a Democrat. <laughs> and the accusation of the book is that very powerful special interests who also fund the Republican Party have used their money and their influence over the Republican Party to achieve a capture of the court. If my premise is correct, there's no way to avoid those facts. So what I need you to do and would ask you to do and ask any reader to do is to get beyond that initial schema, which is there and which I can't change, and look at the evidence that I put a lot of work into this book to try to pull together. This book is part textbook, it's part detective story, it is part pros memo, prosecution memo, and part warning. And I think if you want to look at it, to go back to your word, John, as an argument, jurors hear arguments from lawyers. This book is my argument. Look and see if you think the evidence supports it, and if it does, there's your answer. Okay. Raise your hand, wait for the microphone to come to you. Yes, sir. Um, it seems like uh, Trump gave us, a, or gave the country a permission structure for shamelessness. Um, yeah. You know, the, the quiet part is constantly being said out loud. Um, all sorts of despicable behavior that sort of used to be in the dark is now out in the open. Yep. Mm -hmm. How do you square your disclosure initiative with that? Because I thought it sounds great. Wouldn't it be terrific if instead of, you know, White House hates puppies, it was, you know, this was ad was paid for by ExxonMobil. It, but... Does ExxonMobil really care anymore? Does anybody really care anymore about being in the spotlight as a bad guy? 
I mean, if yeah. somebody said, let me just finish the thought for a second. If, if ExxonMobil said, um, yeah, we're, we, sell, we sell gasoline. That's what we do. We employ a lot of people. We don't like this guy. Like, how does your Disclosure Act fight against that kind of shamelessness? Because they don't seem to care about their grandchildren. I, I do think that um, there is still a fair amount of sensitivity, um, even in non real persons, even in corporate persons. And I think that part of what has degraded the debate has been the massive extent of the intermediation by front groups between people. So that it's not just in campaign ads, it's in all sorts of uh, arenas. It's in Twitter bots. It's in where people can express themselves from hiding, like snipers in the bushes. And I think if when people do things from hiding, they tend to behave worse than when they are in the public square with everybody else. Um, and I think we would be in a much healthier place in our country if, and if I may quote Scalia, I'm not gonna quote him accurately, but uh, what Scalia has said about this is that this is the home of the brave. And one of the things that citizens have to do to be brave is to stand up and be responsible for their views when they offer them. And I limit myself only to those who spend more than $10,000 in an election, which is a pretty narrow group of influencers. Interesting question, though. Thank you. Congresswoman, yes, please. Here, we're going to send a, a microphone out. First of all, I want to thank Jennifer Rabb and, and the Roosevelt House for having this wonderful opportunity for us sure. to hear from the senator. And, and uh, thank uh, Senator Whitehouse for all of your work, but I would like you to focus on the terrible effect this has had on elections. And I would like to know, I think transparency is very important because voters should know who's trying to influence whom mm -hmm. and what, who is behind, because a lot of times, as the senator said, it's economic interests. And, and, and we should be aware of that. And, and I think the worst Supreme Court case and there have been a lot of bad ones recently, has uh, been this Citizens United. And it has absolutely changed our campaign system. You don't know how much money's coming at you from where. And the threats come at you, and they tell you to shut up, or we're going to spend independent expenditures and take you out. And we've all had massive amounts of independent expenditures spent against us, and no one knows anything about it. I, I want to publicly thank the senator for his work on big oil and their influence on trying to stop uh, the understanding that uh, fossil fuels are causing well, the destruction hearings, of our Well, your hearings, Madam climate. Chairman, and Chairman Ro Khanna's hearings working for you have been essential to that, so bravo back to you. But uh, also, you were threatened. It was in the paper. Big oil spent hundreds of thousands of dollars against you in a campaign. And when people threaten you as an elected official, and they say, stop talking about this, or we're going to take you out. And you know they can spend millions of dollars against a candidate who is putting the truth out, as he was, on, on big oil. So could you talk a little bit about what this has done to politics in our, in our country? And yeah. at the very least, they fight the disclosure like you wouldn't believe. At the very least, if you could see who's trying to buy influence would be a big thing. But this has got to be overturned or it's going to destroy, I think, our political system. I agree with you, and I think um, we can do more to get it overturned because the platform that we have to work from is an American public that absolutely loathes and despises this dark money for the exact same reasons, Chairman Maloney, that you just described. And if you read Jane Mayer's New Yorker piece some time ago, she got her hands on either a tape or a transcript of a conversation between Mitch McConnell's political minions and the Koch brothers' political minions, and they were minioning it up together about what to do in the uh, election, and they were talking about one issue that for them was kryptonite. And no matter how they tried to twist it and dirty it and torque it and you know shape it, they couldn't make it work for them. It was a disaster no matter how. And whether you were a Tea Party or a Bernie bro, you hated, 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 hated that issue. And that issue was dark money. So there's a really powerful public um, 
distaste, loathing for it that we as Democrats have not yet done enough to tap into, but when we try, we also run to the Republicans in service to it, stopping us. And I think that's a fight that we need to hang a lantern on, to yes. use your phrase earlier, and make it one of our brands, that we are the people who try to take this out and give citizens their right to know back. And, and, and another point you make in the book that's related to this is the importance of having someone on the court who's actually been in electoral politics, Sandra Day O'Connor being the last one, which you know maybe the, some of the naivete behind Justice Kennedy's decision might not have stood. Uh, yes, sir. Um, I think, Senator, for me, one of the biggest problems about the right-wing majority, I agree that they should not be characterized as conservative, is not only the substance of their decisions, but from a process standpoint, it devalues precedent and makes the law totally uncertain and dependent upon whoever happens to be picking the court at that time. And it, does your book comment on that? It does. A and a, a couple of other process and parliamentary excursions from uh, normalcy that they've engaged in as well. But you're right, in order to get to the results that they want, they have to take procedural and uh, protocol shortcuts that previous courts have not been willing to take and that are a little bit peculiar and inappropriate, I think. So here's a really big one, fact-finding. Fact-finding belongs at the lowest level of the judicial system. It's what trial courts do. Appellate courts aren't supposed to find facts. It's not their job, and there's a separation of powers component to it, because if appellate courts can run around finding whatever facts they want, then there's no constraint on them. Like a horse that you snub down to a post, appellate courts, which have the power to change, as the memo said, American society and economy, are snubbed down to the facts that the judges down at the trial level found. And instead, you get the Supreme Court running around finding facts that are false facts and building decisions on those false facts. There will be no more racist election and voting policies from Southern Republican legislatures, was Shelby County's false fact. All this money is going to be transparent and independent from campaigns, was Citizens United's false fact. So really basic and important principles like false fact finding doesn't belong in appellate courts is flagrantly violated and bad enough that they go into the no-fly zone of false of fact finding, they then go there and find facts that are demonstrably provably clear error, false. We've got time for one final question. Yes, sir. Yes, you do. Um, I've had an idea. This is on, right? So I, uh, I've had an idea of supporting a speaker series of this nature for some time. And I, like two and a half years ago, during a breakfast with uh, Jennifer, I raised the issue. She liked the idea, suggested I take it up with Harold. Uh, and this has been in the making for two and a half years. The, pan the pandemic. Thank you. Day, pandemic. So during a, a light lunch about six weeks ago, Harold said, by the way, maybe this is the right time to launch what we've been talking about for two and a half years. And uh, he said, what do you think of uh, Senator Whitehouse? I, and I started clapping my hands, and I said, great. Okay, that's wonderful, right? I knew a fair bit about the senator before Harold mentioned his name. Uh, then I, at one point, shortly thereafter, Harold, I said, but we need someone to engage the senator okay, who's really going to keep the senator on oh. his toes. Somebody right? who's a real attraction. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And then, okay, I, I think it was actually shortly after John had been a moderator of a program here a couple weeks before that, and I said, phenomenal, right? All that said, uh, from the convers brief conversation we had earlier upstairs, okay, uh, uh, and my preliminary reading of what the book is gonna cover, I was pretty optimistic. Uh, that somewhere in this book, I was going to find a path to resolving some of these really crucial issues. I'm really depressed now. Okay? <laughs> uh, Don't be. Yeah, no, I'm really depressed now. But having said all Don't of that, uh, I'm sure everyone in this room has heard Professor Tribe over the last few days 
talking about the fact that Clarence Thomas's conduct is in direct violation of his responsibilities as a justice and his oath. What do we do about that? The first thing, with, there was a Supreme Court justice who once said, procedure is the bone structure of a democratic society. And what the Supreme Court has now is no procedure for receiving, investigating, evaluating, or reporting on ethics allegations made against the members of the Supreme Court or enforcing them either. And that is just a terrible, terrible place to be. There is a complete accountability-free zone around the court. We've basically told them, you better do this or we are going to do this. And I have legislation to do this and we're gonna start in the next Congress to press for that legislation. The House uh, just had a hearing today with this character, Mr. Schenck, and his $30 million scheme to wine and dine and lubricate and take to holidays, the, uh, what do they call them, the amenable three justices that they focused on. So there are things that we can do. There's some structural things that we can do. The bottom line is, is the transparency and make sure that people know what's going on. Um, but the stakes are really high. I'll, I'll, I'll close with two numbers that everybody should know before they leave. One is that the latest evaluation of the amount of money spent in this court capture scheme was $580 million, more than half a billion dollars. You don't spend that kind of money without having a motive. And if we don't know who you are, we don't know what your motive was. And by the way, we don't even know what decisions went your way because we don't know what business you had before the court. And if you doubt the $580 million, then it is beyond dispute that a eccentric billionaire just gave Leonard Leo's network of front groups a single contribution of $1.6 billion dollars. So the central spider who wove the web that created this court capture operation now has $1.6 billion floating around in the operation, which they can move like the pea under multiple shells and have it pop out wherever into super PAC spending in a Senate race, into a uh, center for the study of the administrative state, into whatever, but um, always congenial to the big special interests. With that, I want to thank the Senator, I want to thank you, but also before we go, I want to thank Jennifer Rabb, um, who's done an extraordinary job for two decades at Hunter College. Congresswoman Maloney, extraordinary job for three decades here. Together, you two have really made our city and our country better. Thank you so much. Be well, Senator, great job.